Hey, product launchers. This is Tracy Hazard, and I'm here with one of our experts that I'm so excited to introduce you to because this is an expertise area I do not have, and I always love to learn something new. So Lauren West is a, I'm a consumer products good expert, and, in, and we're talking specifically in areas that require a lot of process and a lot of development and a lot of effort in terms of making sure you're in compliance, you've done all your documentation, you've really gone through that whole process flow and really good, and you can learn so many things about doing that for all types of product development, not just consumer products and not just beauty products in which you have a particular area in, and beauty products are kind of... I'm going to say challenging because they have a lot of testing requirements. Um, some of them have FDA approval. And so there's sure. definitely that. But you have a lot of what I'm going to call entrepreneur experience, which I think is also really important. So as you're growing, and a lot of our product launchers are growing big brands. And as you're mm -hmm. going growing big brands, you need to understand process and strategies for building process tactics, for building it, tools for building it, because that process flow creates a much better team environment, creates high performance, helps you launch your products faster, be more accurate, and be able to build a big brand. So thanks Definitely. so much for joining us, Lauren. Oh, no, you're very welcome. And thank you for having me, Tracy. I appreciate it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started. Yeah, gosh, that is such a long story. I kind of <laughs> fell into this line of work almost. Um, long story short, um, I started working years ago at a packaging company. And at that time, I supported companies more from a vendor perspective and how to service people in a variety of different um, industries that had consumer products. And most of my clientele at that time really primarily revolved around beauty and pharmaceuticals. And so when that opportunity came to a time of transition, I thought, you know, what would I like to dive into? I've worked a lot both with beauty and with pharmaceuticals, and they're two completely different types of industries, um, different cultures, different fields, all of that. And so at that time, I decided, you know, let me jump onto the whole beauty bandwagon. And, you know, fortunately at that time, I was able to get connected and, um, start basically providing services to OPI products. And they're a very well-known brand um, within the beauty industry. They primarily- If you're, if you're not a girl, maybe you don't yes. know that their OPI <laughs> yes. is probably the nail polish company. <laughs> it, it is, it is. And so I, you know, fortunately was able to land an opportunity there to be able to service them and really kind of see things go from the inside out. And so that's really where I feel I have the bulk of my 10 year experience of really getting my feet wet and diving into that whole, you know, product launch experience and that extends to other kind of beauty products as well um, and I subsequently have supported other beauty brands as well both on staff and independently um, just depending upon how companies want to be, would like to be serviced um, but basically that's that's really kind of you know fell in more on the vendor side and then started to work with different brands and really see how different companies function and how best can their processes improve and being able to see from the inside out so recently um in the last few years i did a consulting opportunity at kaiser and so working within healthcare and that's completely different than you know the beauty <laughs> business and consumer products so for me that was a challenge to kind of you know switch gears and how do you work at process more from you know a people and flow and departmental and culture structure type of process rather than say beauty and product in a product-based format um, still comparable and, and it can go over well but so it, you know I always thing. say that to people is like they're you know they're always wondering how I fell into launching podcasts launching things mm -hmm. like that right launching services and you know what I found is that the the discipline of having the development process and mm -hmm. documentations and having a, and having a system for looking at things yes it le lends well to any kind of launch or any kind of of building of a department department or a team. It, it really, it really truly does. And so, you know, I would say almost every opportunity I've had, you know, is really built upon itself and prepared me for the next opportunities that have come my way. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but coincidentally, it just kind of always just naturally does. And, you know, from a big thing, I would say overall, really, you know, having companies where they're able to establish, you know, times of really taking their teams together and do brainstorming and really utilizing their own resources, internal resources, um, 
most companies, you know, maybe they don't necessarily always leverage that. And that's always really good to do is to really leverage the people that you do have and allow them to kind of present to you what challenges are they having within their certain departments from a process flow standpoint and what they need quicker, better, faster. So that when a whole team understands all the nuts and bolts of what's needed and what's holding people up, there's quicker ways to find solutions to solve those. So um, being able to put in um, you know, quarterly type of meetings like that, as well as putting in process flow and structure flow, a lot of times it's kind of everyone wants to just get something out the door and that's right. great and that is wonderful. And there's definitely times for that, but there's definitely you know, a good point to kind of take a step back and relook at what are we doing, how are we doing this and how we can do it better. Um, so whether that's looking at, you know, do we bring on additional tools? Do we need to put an additional process in place? Um, from like a product type of standpoint, really having that connection from companies that already have like a product development department in place with like a marketing and sales team. So really having that information. So integrate the two. Together. Yeah, to, to really kind of have that communication stream. So sometimes companies don't have that as much in place. And so having that feedback from consumers and customers and retailers go actually back internally to a company is very helpful because the field team sees everything. I mean, they're outside, they're talking to people that buy the product, that love your product, but also, you know, from an, a company standpoint, how can you work better? Well, obviously utilizing your field team in a more efficient, productive way is, is one avenue to consider, um, as well as just looking at internally, um, how you can do things better from the top down. So say if you have an executive um, management team that is very visionary style, that is that is very just kind of, you know, big like ideas. Like an inventor. <laughs> exactly, like an inventor, yeah. That has really big ideas and really having those brainstorm kind of meetings to just dump out all those ideas and seeing kind of where can you start to plan from here. So being able to have, you know, regular type of meetings to be able to pull in what's needed to kind of carry out someone's vision is really ideal and being able to kind of map out the A to Z of what's needed. So from a mapping process standpoint, really kind of tying in key departments. Um, so most companies, you know, they'll tend to have like a procurement or a purchasing team as well as an operation so team. So our people here probably have like a person who maybe yeah. has so many hats. Sure. But I think, you know, I think that's really where you can learn from Lauren because mm -hmm. you're going to be hearing about some things. And I, I think, you know, everyone here feels very time sensitive, right? You got to sure. get the orders out. In the retail world, it feels very high high pressure or fast mm -hmm. pace, right? Especially Definitely. if you manage to get on the shelf. And so sure. if you're just starting that. So, but what I think people discount too quickly is that taking the time to set the systems in place, to put mm -hmm. the process, the tools, the team in place and really separate all of that into individual people instead of keeping so many hats. It, going. it, it, it is ideal. Ambition. It, it is ideal. And so I've seen both formats where you have these companies that are very large, they're established, they have a lot of different departments. And I've seen smaller teams run, you know, much more efficiently, the very small crew. But the challenge with that is really having those systems and putting something in place so that because people are wearing so many hats, there's not enough time for like a lot of changes that happen. Yeah. And, and those naturally do tend to happen. And so really kind of taking a little bit upfront mitigation planning of what can you do in these instances and how can you, you know, combine a couple different people's function into one role, but make it quicker and easier. And also it speaks to like, how quickly do you want to scale as a company? You know what I mean? So even if you're invited to a retailer, let's just say maybe your company's not really prepared or ready to really take that on. And so, you know, I've definitely heard of some cases where, hey, they're jumping on that bandwagon just because they want that opportunity. It's a great opportunity that came along, but can their company really deliver and provide the product at the end of the day? Because yeah. then they're getting hit on the back end. So it's, it's kind of really being smart to you as a business owner and visionary of understanding what can, what are the capabilities in my company, where it's at today, and how can it expand and grow to and work towards that, work towards opening a retail space or or expanding the distribution or also considering different methods. So instead of a traditional, you know, different brick and mortar um, opportunities, also looking at so much e-commerce, there's so many different avenues that are opening up that way in different avenues to consider different options too, to bring in sales different ways. So it's always good to so, keep that in mind. 
Yeah. So that's kind of the, you know, the position here. So I've had a lot of recent discussions with companies that are around, I would say 10 to 20 millions. And Mm -hmm. usually they've started that mostly online. Okay. And so they're usually going from that direction to the shelf, Mm -hmm. having sales reps and having that kind of, and so they're going that direction Mm -hmm. and they want to, you know, they have plans and want to get to a hundred million. And it's like, what does that look like along the way are all the pieces and parts that get that? That's where you can help them sort of see the vision on what do you have? You have this like, you know, almost no organization today. It's like, Mm -hmm. this guy does three things. This woman does four. (laughs) Like, you Mm -hmm. know, it's like, what are they all doing? doing and yeah. how do we turn those into departments and teams and start to grow that out and, and have tools and, yeah. and communication. Yeah. And when you, when you kind of set up that structure, it's something that you and I have talked about previously of um, something I'm working on that I'll be building for the membership group here is putting together kind of, kind of like a little bit of a process flow of some key things you want to establish at different levels of your business. So say if you're like in zero to 20 or say you're focused more e-commerce or you're focused more retail. So I'm putting together kind of like a little guidebook for people to use as a reference point. So that will be (laughs) helpful (laughs) because from like, even from the beauty, standpoint, one of the things I think is so challenging and I, and I think that it's not necessarily only in my expertise and I'm not the expert at it, but it's, it's, I'm always learning about things is looking at when you are producing products for consumers, are you owning your own formulas? Are you owning what you're producing out there in the world? So the challenge with that, with so many different clients and different things is that say you build some great product, you have great sales on it, but say the lab or the sourcing manufacturer that you're working with, they technically own the formula, then you're kind of stuck. So I really think it's, 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 really kind of behoove of the person, you know, whether you're just independent and you're an inventor, you're just kind of starting out or you're exploring stuff is to really consider formula ownership and product ownership up front. There is more cost involved. Um, however, if you particularly hit a great product that's just fabulous and really takes off, you won't have to worry about the legal ramifications of, you know, how, how are you going to work on what if you want to go to a new vendor? What if you want to use multiple different vendors to produce your product? What if all these different scenarios that come into play where then it limits you if you don't own your product or you're open, maybe you can only go with your one source. Well, that's a, actually sources. really analogous to some of the things that goes on in the product world. So a lot of times you might start your product for hard good products. And I was just talking to a company who does toys just this mm-hmm. week. Same thing is that they started out with using the tooling of the factory, which is very similar to like using the formulations of your, Mm -hmm. you know, of the company, the the company that you're working with to Mm -hmm. produce your products, right? Beauty or, or in foods as well. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, but now they're in that transition point and it is hefty investment of creating each one of those tools themselves adding a unique thing to them so that those tools aren't just the same product, just a new Mm -hmm. tool that belongs to them, but it gives them the flexibility of being able to move factories, um, you know, a second source if you need to, because your capacity is growing. And so, yeah, the consideration on when that should happen is so important. And really it's not just a financial decision. It's also a growth decision. Sure. Definitely. Definitely. Cause it gives you different options later on what you want to do from a development standpoint, you know, there's different things to consider that are, you know, when you're looking at doing new products for your company, whether you're new or you're, you know, a little bit more established is, is it really profitable for you? Does it really make sense? I see so many types of discussions where there's some great ideas, but on the back end, is it really going to bring in the profit you potentially desire? And is it worth putting all that investment of your internal or external consultants, depending upon who you have on your team? Is it worth really doing? So um, something I'll be putting together, kind of a very rough general thing it won't work for all types of clients but kind of like a basic like product checklist almost and a sense of you know what you might want to consider looking at to kind of basically decide if something's viable or not essentially um, and I think one of the things do a checklist one of the things that you have a unique insight into is um, <laughs> the cost of complexity right when you have a sure. complex product and stuff and it's hard to assess out at the beginning so if you, if you have this checklist and there's like unknowns there mm-hmm. and you talk to Lauren, she might tell you, oh, 
those could be very costly for you because of the complexity and the process that you would have to use to make these things, to find this yeah. or make that happen. Yeah. The cost of complexity is that thing that just drags the time out, delays, mm -hmm. and delays in the retail market is very costly. It, it is very costly. Not only that, but you'll have, you know, some retailers definitely, you know, charge different brands. They'll charge them fees for not making their deliveries on time. And so that on the back end could be very, very pricey. Or if you're sourcing, you know, components where you're putting together products that have a lot of promotional kind of items with it, you might be sourcing products from China. And so that takes a lot longer. And so sometimes you when you're trying all the things to do, together, yeah, yeah when, you're, when you're trying to do everything rush mode, you are also kind of looking at, you know, what are you really looking at and putting together because that may not work time wise. Yeah. So, so it's, I, there's a couple of things I want to touch on for everyone. So, sure. um, so obviously we're, product launch hazards. So we like sure. to start with the problems. <laughs> so yeah. you mentioned that you Definitely. like, you know, gone into companies that have some significant issues. So let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the smaller ones. Cause I think that's the majority of what people are on our platform here sure. um, have, you know, our smaller brands. And so that sort of startup stage and moving mm -hmm. into it growing and bigger. And so it's a, it's a usually growth problems, I would say like growing sure. pains, mm -hmm. um, but tell me what some of those might be that you would be expert in helping them out. You with. know, really putting documentation in place. You know, I think a lot when you're starting and growing, you know, sometimes it's easy, even when you have a small team, and you're going to a little bit larger team and you kind of have people on board at a different stages. How do we work? How do we function? How do we function better? Really having that documentation of what's working now and what do you want to work towards. So having everything like documented from a process standpoint, plus that helps clarify like how from a team membership standpoint, like how many people do you need to grow by to really do this function well? And so you kind of know from like an input and output, if you only have a two person team, but you're trying to have them do three or four functions, but you're also relying on, you know, potential ex external vendors that are helping you in different capacities and really understanding what their functionality is or how do you want to build that relationship with them. Really having that documentation in place is really key um, besides just knowing what you need. So that's something I, you know, sometimes on occasion, I'll, if they don't have that type of documentation, going in and helping supporting people, figuring out what exactly do you do and, you know, what would help you do your role better or if you wanted to expand in these additional functions, what would we really need to provide you um, in terms of resources, whether that's tools or additional, you know, staff, whatever that might look like. Um, even having systems of having to know what kind of system to use because there's so many different types of project management systems that are out there, for example. Some of them are really low cost, some of them are very expensive, but being able to have a tracking tool because some companies, you know, they'll, they'll strictly only use, say, Excel, and that's okay in some cases, but, you know, again, it's not, you know, online and user-friendly and mobile access and having, like, that information real time. You can so, only do so much with Google Sheets. <laughs> you, you can, you can, and I, and I would say, you know, it's kind of like you drive your team nuts by doing that, by not giving them the option of having some additional tools that are out there. And um, it's all about researching, you know, kind of what fits for you. Um, there's a lot of different types of tools I've, I've tried over the years. Some I prefer more than others, um, but really having that in place as well. So kind of putting together more structure. So a lot of teams I'll go in, even if it's small, it may have a real lack of focus or clarity. So really going in and providing that type of structure and clarity of what's really being, you know, worked on in the next three months or six months. So really doing a little bit more of strategy game plans, more like so on kind a, of a forecast in a way of like, this is what our organization looks like today. And here's what it's going to look like tomorrow. Sure. And what are the team, the tools, the systems yeah. that will go into and, place over time? And looking, yeah, exactly. But looking at that also from a product standpoint. So say if you want to, you know, start off with 10 core products, but you want to expand, what do you really need to be able to do that? And um, all those kind of things to it. So I would say, you know, typically in like an ideal world, although that's very hard to, to, hard to get, is really putting... I would say easily like around two years from a start to finish, start to launch kind of standpoint from a beauty, excuse me, a beauty product standpoint. But that's kind of without a lot of pitches going on. And obviously it depends on kind of where you're sourcing products from and stuff. That, or the length of FDA or, approval. <laughs> or all, of, all of those other kind of things that tie yeah. into it or 
for companies that they're creating, you know, say for some companies, they're working with electronics, you know, so they need that UL approval or all these other things that come into play. So yeah, let's touch on that for a minute because yeah. I mean, documentation is probably the most key thing that happens in these kind of products. So whether you're in the toy industry, the furniture sure. industry has it too, beauty, okay. of course, yeah. food right? Yeah. You're talking about high liability mm -hmm. and, um, you know, consumer safety issues in almost all of those categories. Definitely. Plus, yeah. Definitely. And I think, you know, a lot of companies tend to rely on the expertise of their vendors and that's great and all. However, the thing is, I think it's really important for brands to really take a very proactive approach and really understand who they're working with and what kind of, you know, things are you dividing responsibility between what are you leaving your vendor responsible for because to me the company is still taking on the most risk and liability because you're the face of the product you're the face of the brand it's selling underneath your name and so that's really a concern that sometimes companies tend to back well, and off I and think say, let the vendor do it, but it's good to kind of get yeah. involved and understand what's really there. So. Well, and I think that, you know, too often brands discount, you know, when you're a small business, you discount the fact that you're protected by the factory or protected sure. by a retailer, which is not sure. the case in either yeah. realm. The reality is it's the person who's selling it is in the way today's portal, whether you're on Amazon or eBay or any, you know, yeah. anywhere else, yeah. walmart.com, it's still the same way. The Bonus is on you, and if you're in, you're not in compliance. It's your fault. You can get your business completely shut down overnight. Oh, and exactly. You, and they won't, they won't get sued. You will. Exactly. So in that kind of case, you know, I think a lot of companies that are bigger, they can afford to take a little bit more risk. But I think from, just from a testing standpoint, is to really. You know, take time to plan out the launches a little longer so you can do all the testing that's required. Um, and document the testing. And, that's yes, my big and, thing. And like all the documentation, like, yes. Because, mm -hmm. you know, this is part of the process is it's like, oh, we did do the test, but where's our documentation? It's not even exactly. in one place. Like, that exactly. gets out a lot they, from companies. <laughs> that, and sometimes, say they're working with multiple companies to be able to complete that testing, but they don't really have, like, the follow-through to, to get all the follow-up, to get all that paperwork back to them. So it's like having everything on file. So for example, I had a client where they were looking at some new labs to consider working with, but they didn't really, you know, they kind of started on a project, decided to go another direction. But during that exploration process, they found that the lab that they were working with had some issues with the FDA. So it's always good to do some initial checks because you, you can check, Diligence. On, yeah, <laughs> check online to kind of see, you know, yeah. is there anything pending, um, doing like on-site checks and stuff, having that kind of, how do you want to work with the different vendors that you're working with? So having that document piece in place and having everything on file at your location, not just like a lab or, or, you know, an outside source that you're working with to create what you want. So that, that's definitely key of having everything on, on hand, as well as having kind of like your own kind of audit process for different vendors that you work with. So you as a brand and a company might have a certain standard that might be a little different than maybe what this particular lab or company you're working with. So you might go through that process of establishing a more corporate um, perspective on what you want and then see what, what companies kind of align with that. Yeah. You know, I think that's really also true. Like one of the things that occurs to me is that so often I see a company just as they're sort of on that growth cusp. Mm -hmm. And what really happens is that they've got one person. Mm -hmm. So they rely on that person. They're like, where's this document, you know, or do we, do we do this test? Oh yes. This person knows off the top of their head because mm -hmm. they think that, you know, they, they, they're managing a group of products and they think, oh, this is fine. I can handle this. I know where everything is, but to take the time to, to put it in folders, document it, like yeah. you know, share it with everyone. That's too much work for me. And I've already got a load. Right. Sure. But then what happens when they're sick, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, they leave your company yeah. and now you don't have that core information and you think, oh, well, that's okay. But you go to do an upgraded development a year mm -hmm. from then. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you have no way to know who did this. Where did we go before? Yeah. No information documented. And so that's the danger that I see so often in these in small brands growing mm -hmm. yeah. right at that level of where you've got someone who's your one person with the information. Mm -hmm. You're in dangerous water. Oh, definitely. I mean, even if say you're a small team of 20, like you're a very lean team, it's still challenging because, you know, people take different directions. They may have new opportunities to present themselves. If you don't have things documented, then it's really, you're in a catch 22 because now you have to kind of start from scratch or really scramble to find what you need. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, what are some best practices? Some things that you could that you wish your you wish the brands you worked with did it from the start. Yeah, that would you know really planning. Um, really, I would say really it comes down to planning and understanding you know realistic timeframes for things. Um, I think from a beauty perspective, everyone rushes to get things out the door, which is great because you want to be first to market and you really want to get your idea out there. But on the other hand, is it really going to be successful long term? Can you really repeat this process? What's going to happen with reorders? All those kind of things. So really having that accurate assessment up front um, and putting together, you know, quarterly kind of meetings where you're really planning what's the overall corporate direction for your product um, development and launches. I think it's easy for, you know, executives and sales teams to be like, hey, let's add this new thing in, but does it really make sense for us? And can we really do it quickly? And all these other factors. And so there's always tends to be a lot of side conversations to things rather than a, a clear executive direction. So in really having that buy-in process, so allowing you know, your different teams to present what do you feel is going to work well for you as a company and try to sell their their idea internally. Um, so really having that in place, planning and also some structure. Um, so really doing, you know, quarterly executive meetings that really are geared towards what are we producing in the next year and almost structuring things like a three-year plan almost because a lot of projects take more time than what people tend to realize. So really putting like a three to five year structure with things. So even though I'm thinking I need to improve what's working today, what is really my plan five years out? And it can kind of seem a little arbitrary. Like, why would I want to do that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm in the hamster wheel right now and I'm just trying to get this done. But like, what's really going to work long, long term and what's going to benefit for me later? So even pausing and kind of just taking a moment and doing that kind of structure and plan and flow now will be so much helpful later on. So, you know, this is a really good example of that client I was referring to before mm -hmm. that I was talking with this week. One of the things that they did was that they had been in business for since the, the you know, for quite some time. And what happened was, is that they were doing sort of more of that mail order way back when we were doing cataloging and sure. mail order style stuff, mm -hmm. but they had been one of the early adopters of putting their products on Amazon. And so it was about 2008 and they took the time to have an evaluation of how they did the previous year, where the growth was, and they saw a decline in catalog, but they saw an increase, a, a growing increase over the course of the year in Amazon. And so they made the strategy going into 2009 to dive deeper into Amazon. And it, it was the smartest thing and it saved their company because the recession hit. Oh, and so okay. because they were on Amazon, Amazon was one of the few things that kept growing during that recession. It shifted their entire company model Mm -hmm. But if they had not sat down and reevaluated and looked at that, they wouldn't have been in that position to understand this was working and this is growing. We should do more of it. Yeah. And that's a good point of really looking at what does work well, what's really a growth, an area of growth or a channel of growth, let's just say, because so many different companies, even if they're smaller or bigger, they can be approached by many different opportunities and what's really going to work for, well for them as a business. Yeah. You're, may, you're too apt to do them all. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's great. It's great that, you know, companies are being present with all those opportunities, but it's also good to know what's going to work best yeah. for you and what you feel you can commit to long term and um, picking, you know, what kind of model might work for you or just kind of dipping your toes into something and trying like a new model out versus flipping your whole business direction, which is a huge, you know, huge gamble, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of sometimes when you're trying to try out something new, maybe, you know, with a smaller mix of products or just, you know, a small little incubation period, let's just say, instead of doing a huge change, that's always an option as well too. So, yeah. well, you know, if this all sounded like a foreign language to you, like, <laughs> you're listening to this and it sounded like, I don't, you know, I'm this visionary. I'm like up mm -hmm. here. I'm like, I have ideas and I just want stuff to get done and I don't sure. know how to get it done. Then you probably need to tune in to, to talk to Lauren. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, kind of from like a, you know, perspective of kind of ongoing type of things, you know, I'm imagining something a little bit more process flow, um, really being able to take people through, you know, a beauty product launch of what does that kind of look like that might be interesting to some of some of your members um, just because it's an area that some people may not really understand or know about um, but as with anything in manufacturing I'm sure from your own experience it's like things always take longer and there's always more steps and things involved than you might initially realize or think of um, it's always being involved with manufacturing I don't know over the last 
you know, 10 to 15 years, it's been amazing how many things go into something that actually gets produced in, in consumers' hands. And with the whole rise of really a whole, um, a whole focus on sustainability, a lot of consumers are becoming more open to kind of figuring out how can you work with brands where that's a real focus of theirs. So whether it's packaging or just a manufacturing process that's more sustainable to the environment, um, that's also been kind of a, you know, a new flux where brands are starting to look at how can we you know, embrace that and how can we implement that in our process already from, from where we're at? How can we tweak what we're doing or use different source, different types of um, materials and everything like that as well? Sorry, I muted myself That's temporarily because okay. all of a sudden the gardeners decided that they were going to you know, go pack the bushes, which yeah. are desperately needed. My car keeps getting scraped. That's so. okay. <laughs> but anyway, no, well, I, what I want you to do, product launchers, is to reach out to Lauren. When you have questions, and you know, this is the thing, it's like Lauren's here to help you at that early stage of evaluation and make sure that you have what you need because she knows when you get to be the big brand, you're going to really need her. So, you know, yeah. the groundwork in place and you just consider some of the things that she has to teach you and has to show you and, and put in some of these best practices early on, you're going to grow faster because systems take over and, and also help you make more aware of those hazards that we keep talking about, the, the ones that you know cause you problems, right? They, they bring them to light faster. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's good to put systems in place from the get-go so that you don't get so far evolved that then you feel like you have to go backwards to go farther. So as much as you can start out with really, you know, taking account of how do you function, how can you function better, um, that's, you know, obviously more ideal than as you grow and you onboard and bring on more, expand your team, you have more options, you can actually accomplish more by having processes in place so that there's a clear format and, and direction for people to go. Well, stay tuned for more office hours and documents, and uh, that'll be in the resource library. Yes, so that'll be coming soon. Them up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and more more time, and and of course, you can always reach out to Lauren right through her expert profile, so you can make a connection, she can do an evaluation with you, she can have a chat with you, and and figure out if you're if you're ready for what she has to share and ready for the things that she does, or if you just need a little bit of this groundwork and need some more lessons. On exactly. The even, even just, you know, to brainstorm ideas. I mean, I think that's even having that sounding board for people, especially when you're new and just starting out, it's always good to get a little bit of feedback. From off. someone who's been there and done that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, and if you have any questions or any suggestions for Lauren as to what you would like her to cover, specifically in the beauty, beauty area, but in process and in growing a brand from 10 million to 100 million, like any of those types of things, please feed her, feed her questions. Um, you can always do that right on the expert out, office hours page. So you can ask it specific to the, her next office hour topic, or you can just ask them in general and we'll make sure they get to her in case you can't tune in to one of her office hours because the timing doesn't work out for you. We want you to always be able to have a connection to any of our experts, Lauren especially. So thanks so much, Lauren, and I'm so glad you're on our platform because you add a much needed perspective. Thank you for the time today, Tracy. I appreciate it. It was a great interview.